Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to church. Welcome to Christian training. This, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice this morning. Those that are online that has joined us, we want to welcome you here this morning, for we know that in Psalms 86, verse 11 and 12, uh, it says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. But the, you know, the main verse I like in, in verse 11, the first part where it says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. We've come this morning here in Christian training that we can learn the things of the Lord. That's what Christian training is all about. And we are here to learn this morning. So I want to encourage everyone. We're welcoming you here in the sanctuary, those that are online. But I want to encourage you, get your notebook, get your Bible, get your pencil, get your pen. And let's learn the things of the Lord as we welcome his presence.
serve a faithful God. Hallelujah. We do serve a God that is always faithful. You know, at uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 9, uh, it says that, uh, so when they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And we all heard of the blessing that follows Abraham and, and the covenant that goes with that. And it simply takes faith to be a part of that. You know, everybody should be given in their tithe. It's uh, the radical minimum. It's the requirement. The Bible says, wherein will you rob God in tithing and offering? So we know that if you don't give your tithe, you're simply robbing from God. And so we know that that's the requirement. That's the minimum. But it takes faith to give above and beyond that. And that's where you get the blessings of Abraham is through faith. So if you want those blessings to follow you, then you've got to commit an act of faith. And an act of faith is called offering. It's given above and beyond the tithe this morning. So if you've given a, made a faith pledge to uh, missions or keeping the dream alive, uh, you know, we may have hit that mark over there, but there's still some of us that have some pledges that we uh, need to make, whether it's some miracle monies that still needs to come in. Let's keep those pledges coming in and, and let's give in faith and Let's take that step of faith so we can have those blessings of Abraham. So uh, let's pray that for this offering this morning, and uh, let's just see what our faith will do. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you today, O oh God, that we have this opportunity to give. We thank you today, Lord God, that you have uh, provided for us. You are the source of all of our finances. Lord, we give you the tithe because it belongs to you already. And Lord, now we're going to give an act of faith called an offering today, above and beyond our tithe, Lord God. Lord, that you may take it and use it for your kingdom. We ask that you bless the giver today. And Lord God, we ask that this be an act of faith. And in Jesus' name, we give you the praise. Amen. This side can march to Brother Banks and this side to Brother Elliot. God bless you. Good morning, church. Come on, we can do better than that. Good morning, church. Let's all stand. You know, Pastor has been, uh, you know, God gave him a vision for the God built series, a God built life. And we've been having an awesome time with this series. Amen? Amen. And, you know, if we take the series and take the different, uh, lessons that have been taught, and if we apply them to our lives, then, you know, I'm telling you, we will have a God-built life. Yeah. And what has been taught thus far is very, is very good, and we need these things, and these are principles, Christian principles for Christian living. And this morning, God, well, God put upon pastor uh, to, to have someone come and teach this morning, and the person that he, he, put on pastor's heart and mind, this young man is very capable, very good. You know him very well. Actually, I've been knowing him ever since he was a little lad here at the church, at the Peninsula Pentecostals. I remember him when he was little, when he, matter of fact, I remember when he was born. And he's very capable this morning. He is the youth pastor here at the Peninsula Pentecostals. You know, God has been using him mightily. 
He did an excellent job. You heard him this morning on the keyboard. He, he's the minister of music here. So let's welcome brother, our minister, Jordan Easter, to the pulpit as he teaches this morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Can we go ahead and just stretch a little bit? I know that we worship, but go ahead and stretch a little bit. Move your hands around. I know we're all still waking up a little bit, warming up this morning. How many of y'all are thankful that God woke you up this morning? How many of y'all are thankful that God put breath in your lungs this morning? It's so, it's so easy for us to take these very simple things for granted, but man... We just sometimes need to stop and thank God for how good he's been to us. I mean, does, I know we thank God for all the big things that happen in our lives, but sometimes we have to thank him for the things that we don't even notice he's doing. Things behind the scenes. Things that he's protected and shielded us from. God is so good and we give him the glory. Can we one more time just give God a hand clap of praise this morning? Amen. Uh, Turn to the person beside you and tell them, I am so glad to see you here at Christian Training. So glad that you are my neighbor. I get to sit beside you. We're going to have church on our road today. Amen. We're going to have, we're going to give God a praise on our road today this morning, but not in Christian Training. We're going to save that for a worship service. You may be seated. You may be seated. Uh, as, as Brother Farmer mentioned, I, I serve as the youth pastor, and so Mostly at this time, I am upstairs teaching the students. This is actually the first time I've ever taught in the adult Christian training. And so I'm a little bit kind of excited for this. And I hope that what God's given me, uh, it will find root in your heart and that you'll apply it to your life. Does everyone have a handout? I want to make sure everyone has a handout. If you don't, raise your hand. And I believe that our wonderful ushers will be able to get it to you. But it looks like everyone has one. Uh, as, as we know, we are in the series God Built. Everyone say God, God. Built. Pastor gave, uh, or God gave pastor, I should say, a vision last year where we took Matthew 16, 18 to heart, where Jesus said that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, Jesus said, I will build my church. That is not a maybe. That is not an if statement. He says, I'm going to do it. He is going to build his church, and it's up to us to play a part in that. Amen. But this is what he goes on to say is that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I am so glad that even with all our inadequacies, all the areas for growth that I personally need and that we as a church need, God is still protecting us from every attack and every plan and every scheme from the enemy. God is shielding us. Aren't you thankful that God is protecting his church in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of everything going on in our world? Our God is still on the throne and he is protecting his people. Uh, first, today I would like to give honor and thanks to my pastor and I, what I believe as the Bible teaches us, the angel to this local church, Pastor Arango. Pastor today has given, yes, let's give Pastor a hand clap of appreciation. Today, actually, he's teaching leverage, our young adults, because our pastor has a vision. He has a, a heartfelt burden for not just the adults, not just the children, but everybody in the church. He has a passion. And so he wanted to teach. And so he's teaching upstairs to the young adults today. But I'm so thankful for my pastor, his covering in my life, his, uh, his oversight and his protection for me. Uh, he has given me the privilege and great responsibility on teaching the topic of God built servanthood. Uh, when I first came to pastor around the age of 15 years old, and I expressed to him a desire to be used of God and that I felt a call to ministry, he met with me and he required me to start reading books and then write essays explaining what I had learned through the books. The first book that pastor ever required of me to read and the first book that helped open my mind to the world of ministry was a book by Charles Swindoll titled Improving Your Serve. It was in between the pages of this book that the foundational understanding of not just ministry as we know it, but of what it means to be a Christian was laid out. And so today I have the opportunity to teach to you God-built servanthood. 
God built servanthood. Let's begin to pray and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to dive into your word. I pray that our minds would be opened. Our hearts would be open. Help us to receive what we are going to find today. Help us to have open ears. And I pray that the word would find good soil so that it can bring forth, it can find root and bring forth fruit in its due season. We pray this in Jesus name. Everyone say amen. Awesome. So let's get into this. We are Christians. Everyone say I am. A Christian, which in one definition means that we are to be or to pursue being Christ-like. Thus, our lives should look more and more like him every day. Did, Did you know that Christian was actually a derogatory term? In Bible days, believers called themselves the way. They called themselves believers. They, they called themselves disciples. They, they never really called themselves Christians until later in the book of Acts. It was first in Antioch that Gentiles looked at the Christians, looked at these disciples, looked at these believers, looked at these people that called themselves the way and called them Christians. It was common for the Greeks in those days to give uh, comedy names to particular groups. For instance, those loyal to the Roman general Pompey were dubbed the Pompeians. And the followers of General Sulla were called Sulians. Those who publicly and enthusiastically praised the emperor Nero Augustus received the name Urena Augustian, meaning of the party of Augustus. To the Greeks, this was a fun word game and a verbally dismissive gesture to dismiss a group. So when this new group of believers that were still following and still believing in Jesus Christ and living like Christ, the Gentiles looked at them and said, hey, these are like little Christs. And so that's where we get the term Christians. But, but I have a question for us today. Why would the world look at the disciples and of their own volition connect them with Christ? Was it their clothing? Was it their doctrine? Was it the way they did their hair? Was it their choice of food? What was it that would cause a pagan Gentile to look at a disciple, turn to their friend and say, that's a little Christian. I am unashamedly and unapologetically declare that I am a Christian. But the believers in the book of Acts didn't have to do that. There is something about them that made the world stand up and say, you look like Christ. I would to God that we would leave this building today and not just simply by what I tell a person or just simply by the way I dress, but that there would be something in my life that they would look at me and say, they look like Christ. People that didn't believe in Christ, people that worshipped other gods, looked at the believers and said, you remind me of that guy that we crucified a few months ago. You look just like him. What was it? What was it that made them connect these dots, Christ and the disciple? Well, we don't have to wonder anymore. Jesus himself told us in John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you... Everyone say me, that we love one another as I have loved you. Don't love them as your mom loved you, as your dad loved you. But I want you to love your brother like I loved you. I want you to love your sister like I have loved you. By this, everyone say by this. All will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It was the way that they loved one another that affiliated them with Christ. It wasn't what they said. It wasn't what they did. I'm sure that they preached Christ. And I'm sure that they, that they dressed a certain way or that they talked a certain way. But Jesus said it wasn't going to be how you preach. It wasn't going to be by the miracle signs and wonders. But it's going to be how you love one another. That the world will call you a Christian. It's one thing for me to call myself a Christian. But I want the world to look at me and call me a Christian. The word for love that Jesus used here in the Greek is agape. Agape is to love by choice. Agape is not the type of love that is associated with an overwhelming emotion. It's not when you get the butterflies in your stomach when you see your significant other. It's not when you see your favorite food coming out of the restaurant kitchen. That's not the type of love that Jesus was talking about. He was talking about the love that is, that is developed by choice. Agape 
is not the expectation of return. Agape is deciding to choose and prefer someone above yourself. Therefore, when Christ is telling his disciples to love one another, he is truly telling them to prefer one another. Preference is a matter of priority. Prefer is the idea of choosing one thing over another. It's not saying that everything else is bad or everything else is wrong. It's just saying, I prefer this. Again, when you go to a restaurant and you take out a menu, there may be many things on that menu that you like, but there's one thing that you prefer. And what Jesus is teaching his disciples to do is that there's many things in life that you can give your attention to. There's many things in life that you can give your love to. But what I'm telling you to do is to prefer your brother and prefer the kingdom above everything else. We have to choose the needs of one another above the needs of ourselves. Again, preference does not negate the value of the other options. Preference doesn't mean that you ignore yourself or your personal needs, but it does mean that you choose others first. Servanthood is agape, and agape is choosing others first. Jesus told us this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but... To serve and to give his life a ransom for many. When Paul wrote about love or agape, the same word in 1 Corinthians 13, he described agape as this, patient, kind. It's not jealous. It doesn't brag. It's not arrogant. It doesn't act disgracefully. It doesn't seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. It doesn't keep account of wrongs suffered. Isn't that an amazing type of love? That's not a natural type of love. We keep records of what people have done to us. But Jesus is calling you to love your brother. And in order to love your brother, you can't keep records of their wrongs. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It keeps every confidence. It believes in all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Paul again uses this word agape in his letter to the church in Ephesus. He was actually telling them a prayer. He says, I'm praying for you. And he says this in verses 17 through 18 of the third chapter. I'm praying that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, everyone say me. Being rooted and grounded in agape may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. Some translations, very loose translations say that Paul was giving the dimensions of Christ's love. But most scholars agree that the dimensions that Paul was giving was not about the love of God, but it was talking about what God was building, his church. So in this prayer, Paul is desiring the church to be grounded in agape so that they can comprehend with everyone else in the church what is the width, length, and depth, and height. So Paul is referencing the spiritual building that God is building, which is his church. If this is the case, then agape, the type of love where we serve one another and prefer one another above ourselves, is the way that we comprehend the dimensions to what God is trying to build. I know we're preaching about God built. I know we're teaching about God built. But we can't understand the dimensions of what God is trying to build until we find ourselves rooted and grounded in agape. What does it mean to be rooted and grounded in agape? That means when the storms of, of, of offense come, because offense will come. When, when, when you get into little situations where, where you're upset with a brother, you're upset with a sister, agape has you so rooted and so grounded that you realize this offense cannot out take the length of what God is trying to do in his church his church is higher than my offense his church is wider than my perspective but I can only understand his perspective what God's blueprint is for the church through if I'm rooted and grounded in agape and that's not emotion that's a choice to prefer people I cannot see what God wants to do in the ministries of this church unless I'm rooted in the idea I prefer you above myself. I, I can't understand what God is what God is giving pastor and the visions and the messages that pastor is preaching until I am rooted and grounded in agape. Servanthood thus is the scale of a God-built church. The measure of servanthood in our church is the scale that determines the potential of our growth. Paul said, I want you to 
comprehend. That word comprehend in the Greek doesn't just mean understand. It means to violently take hold of. Paul is saying, I want you to violently get a hold and grasp this understanding of agape. Don't meander into love. Don't, don't, don't casually drift into agape. You have to violently pursue it. It reminds me of the writer of Hebrews who says, pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no man will see God. If we are going to have a God-built church, we need to comprehend. We need to violently take hold of love with all the saints not just your love towards them but they need to love as well Paul says I need everybody in the church to get a hold of this this isn't for the pastor and the leadership this isn't for the ministry I need all the saints to get into this I need everybody in the church to be rooted and grounded in this love that says I don't feel it, but I choose you. I, I may not see it through my natural eyes, but I'm going to prefer you. Listen, if we want TPP to be the largest church on the peninsula, then we need all the saints of TPP to become servants who will serve with that agape kind of love. They don't need credit. They don't need to be prodded or pushed. They don't need to feel some emotional inspiration. They don't need someone to dramatically inspire them. They don't need pastor to say, we need more people to get involved and we, we need more people to serve. But there's something on the inside of them that says, I will give of myself I will serve in the kingdom that is what TPP needs to be the largest church on this peninsula listen you may not have been called to preach and that's not a problem you may not have been called to teach that's okay but you have been called to serve you may not be able to carry a tune if it had handles but you have been called to serve you may not be able to organize and administrate but you have been called to serve. We all are called to servanthood. So let me explain what is servanthood. Servanthood is the heart of Christ. As read earlier, Mark 10 verse 45, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Speaking of himself, Jesus simplified his mission to two objectives, serve and give. Wait, wait, didn't he come to do miracles? Yeah, that was a form of service. Wait, wait, didn't he come to preach? Yes, that was a form of service. Everything Jesus did could be summed up into serving and giving. If that's what he did, how much more should we do that? Throughout the Gospels, the heart of Christ is repeatedly displayed when in the scriptures it says he looked on the crowd and was moved with compassion why because it wasn't just something that he was doing it was something that was in his heart servanthood is the heart of christ number two servanthood is the mind of christ philippians chapter 2 verses 3 through 4 says let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit that's hard can we be honest when, when we get involved in the church we are still people and, and we'd be ignorant to say I have no selfish ambition, you know. <laughs> there's, there's, I'm not trying to get any personal gain out of it. It may not be that you want the recognition. It may not be that you want a stage. But you may still want a pat on the back. That's some type of self-ambition. Right. If you're doing it because you feel that you have more giftings than other, belt, uh, other people, you're doing it out of conceit. And Paul is urging the church, I want you to be involved. Don't get me wrong, but don't do it out of selfish ambition. Don't do it with conceit. This is how I want you to do it. You get as low as you can go. In lowliness of mind, this is how you serve. Esteem others better than yourself. I, I know we can read it and say, you know, oh, yeah, that's what I do. No, we don't. It's not natural for us to do that. It's not in our nature to be this way. Look at what Paul says next. Look, each of, I want each of you to look out, not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Paul is making a steep request. Let nothing. You know what nothing means in the Greek? Nothing. I should never do anything 
with a desire to promote my own agenda. That's tough. I should think of people as better than myself. That's tough. I need to look after other people's needs when I have enough trouble looking after my own. That's tough. This is hard stuff, and this requires more than a rewiring of your carnal brain. There aren't adapters that you can buy in the spirit to use your current brain and operate in this dimension. You, 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 you can't just simply say, Lord, I am the way I am. Help. Can you give me an adapter so that I don't, so when it goes this way, it actually goes that way? No. There, there's no, you can't rewire your current brain that way. Which is why Paul goes on to say, if you want to do this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's impossible to do what Paul mentioned before without the mind of Christ. You cannot do it with your natural mind. Servanthood is only done through the mind of Christ, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. God built servanthood requires a completely transformative and brand new way of thinking you can't you can't adopt some of the thinking from the world and still be a god-built servant let me let me give even more context some of you have different careers where they have trainings and i'm sure there's principles but i i i bet you all the principles that they're teaching you that are good really come from jesus the world is trying to adapt christ-like values into their leadership and here we are trying to adopt world-like values into our servanthood. No, let's use Jesus as our picture. Watch. Attempting to serve in the kingdom with the thinking of this world is a recipe for long-term bitterness and offense. If you don't have the mind of Christ, when people hurt you because they will, you'll be offended forever. And you'll be scarred from serving ever again. That's because you have the mind of your flesh. But you need the mind of Christ. Number three, servanthood is the definition of ministry. Romans chapter 15 verse 25 says, But now I go, Paul is talking, unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. When we see the word minister, we think preach, teach, exhort, prophesy. But Paul wasn't going to, do, to Jerusalem to do any of those things. He wasn't going to preach. He wasn't going to Jerusalem to lay hands on the sick. He wasn't doing anything, but any of those. But he says, I'm going to minister. I'm going to minister. So let's keep reading. Romans chapter 15, again, 25 through 28. But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and of Achaia to make a certain contribution, money. The people of Macedonia and Achaia wanted to give money to Jerusalem for the poor saints that were still there. It hath pleased them verily, and, there, and now... They're debtors, they are, for if the Gentiles... So what Paul is saying is that the people in Macedonia are debtors to the saints in Jerusalem. And, and so they felt the need to give back to the saints in Jerusalem. And Paul is saying they should because they're Gentiles. And they are partakers of the spiritual things. Now their duty is to minister to the Jews, the Jewish saints, in carnal things. Wait. Ministry isn't restricted to spiritual things. Paul said you can minister someone in a carnal thing. When therefore I have performed this and I have sealed them to this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. Paul wasn't going to Jerusalem to give them a word. He was going to Jerusalem to meet a physical need. Therefore, ministry is not about platforms. Ministry is about meeting needs. There's another translation that I want to bring to your attention. The New American Standard Bible in a more, really, conservative translation, it reads, but now I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints. In your Bible, the word ministry and server are interchangeable. They actually are the same exact word in the Greek, diakonos, because servanthood is ministry. Servanthood and ministry are inseparable. When pastor comes to the pulpit to preach today and meets the spiritual needs of the church, he is serving. But when pastor meets with you in his office because your life is in shambles and he gives you very practical advice and instruction, he's still serving. He doesn't need a mic. 
He doesn't need to stand behind a pulpit. Our pastor serves 24-7, 365 days a year. He is consistently and constantly meeting the needs of the church. He, by definition, is a true minister. All servanthood is ministry, and all ministry is servanthood. Really quickly, the form of servanthood, again in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 7, uh, Paul references that Jesus took the form of a servant. So that's the next blank. The Bible says that Jesus took on the form of, the, of a servant. Servanthood is not an ambiguous idea. There is a form to it. There is a way you can form and fashion a servant. And so I wanted to give you four ways to describe the form of a servant. For F, F I would like to use the word faithful. Faithfulness is the trademark of servanthood. It is impossible to be a good servant and not be faithful. Let me say that again. It's impossible to be a good servant and not be faithful. Jesus likens it into Matthew in Matthew chapter 24 5 verse 23. When he gives, gives this parable, that he says that the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Servanthood in a God-built church requires that I be faithful. Faithful is being consistent and dependable. As we go through these, the acronym, I want you to think about which one do I need to work on the most. Maybe it's faithfulness. When you answer the call to servanthood or when pastor invites you to serve in the church, make sure that you attempt to be faithful. Being faithful is more than being on time and finishing a task. Faithfulness is being on, is being on time with a good attitude. Faithfulness is fish, finishing the task without grumbling. Reverse faithful and you will see full faith. You can't be full of faith and negative at the same time. So there's no room for negative servants. You can't be full of faith and hard to work with at the same time. There's no such thing as a hard to work with servant in the kingdom of God. If we have the form of servanthood, we are faithful and thus we are full of faith. We must take on the form of faithfulness. Oh, I want to use obedient. Talents are great and giftings are helpful, but obedience is paramount. God would rather choose a servant that is obedient over one that is talented. Saul, he was talented. And he most certainly was gifted. But he had a problem with obeying the instruction of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, Samuel says to Saul, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Two chapters earlier, the prophet gives King Saul a heads up that God was going to take the kingdom from him. And when Samuel does this, he says that God has found a man after his own heart. What could cause God to call David a man after his own heart? Was it that he praised and he worshipped? I'm sure that had something to do with it. But as I look in scripture, his praise was not what made David a man after God's own heart. It wasn't his worship. It wasn't him writing psalms. Let's read Acts 13, 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also God gave a testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. God connects being after his heart with obedience. He's thankful for your praise and your worship, but he's looking for obedience. He's looking for people who will do all of my will. This is what it means to be after the heart of God. It means to do all of God's will. God is looking for obedient servants. R in the acronym, I want to give the word ready. The biblical definition of serve or ministry literally means to wait, which is why we also call servers at restaurants waiters. Their job as a server is to wait on people at the table. A good server waits so that they can be ready when called upon. I understand that in restaurants, it can get really busy and being a waiter can be a hard job. But have you ever found yourself in a restaurant? where the waiter came back like every minute and 10 seconds to check on you. 
And as soon as you got your drink, they're like, hey, can I get you a refill? And you didn't even have time to take a sip before they asked you for a refill. Or you've been in a conversation and the waiter comes back every few seconds. You're like, we're good. I, I just need a second, you know. Like, or, well, they say they come to ask, hey, are you ready to order? You're like, no, we're still looking at the menu. And as soon as you crack it open, are, are you ready to order, you know. Like they're, 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 they're right on the spot. But it still kind of is a little bit unsettling. Or have you ever found yourself in a place where you're at a restaurant and you were ready to go? But the waiter was nowhere to be found. My dad is a funny character. And I remember sometimes when we'd be, he, whenever my dad is, we're, we're done eating, he's ready to go. He's ready to go. And sometimes if the, we'd wait, he says, okay, I'm going to wait 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and 15 minutes will go by. He will get up and go find the server because he's like, I am ready to leave. Sometimes when you're ready to order, when you're ready for a refill, it's like there's a spectrum. Either there's on one side, they're, they're so quick and they're always there, almost to the point where you can't eat. And then on the other side, they're never there. But then there's a happy medium where they're just ready. I wonder how God feels when he calls me to serve, but I'm so busy with other responsibilities and so caught up with other things that I am nowhere to be found. I, I feel like God says, hey, waiter, waiter, I, I'm sorry to bother you, but I need someone to start the outreach ministry. Oh, I'm sorry, Jesus. I've been so busy serving the table of career that I haven't had a chance to see if you needed anything. God, God says, waiter, waiter, I, I'm sorry to bug you, but I need someone to help in Kid Splash. I'm so sorry, Jesus, but I am not qualified to serve at the table because I haven't mastered the whole tithes and offerings things yet. God says, waiter, waiter, I'm sorry to trouble you, but I need someone to step up and be a connection group servant. Oh, I'm sorry, Jesus. I've been so busy serving the table of personal time. The tables of work and family have me overwhelmed. I really need to serve me, and I am not sure that I'll have time to help the group. Listen, in the restaurant of life, there are many tables to be served. And it is nearly impossible to give every table the same amount of attention. But there is one table that you must always be ready for at the drop of a hat. And that is the table of God's kingdom. I know there's a lot of responsibilities in life and we have to cater to those. But there's one table that as you're catering to this, you have to keep an eye on his kingdom. Jesus even said, seek ye first. What? The kingdom. And his righteousness. And all the other tables will be taken care of. You know, the Bible says that God will send angels who are ministering spirits to you on your behalf. This is what I feel. As you serve God's table, he will send angels to serve the other tables that you are so worried about. The table of career, serve God's kingdom. And the angels will begin to minister to your career. Serve the table of God's kingdom and God will send angels to minister to your family. I'm not saying ignore the table. But there's one table that is priority and that's God's kingdom. I remember one time being at a restaurant and our waiter was so good. They they were observing. I didn't even have to... Think I needed a drink. They saw the cup. They were ready. They, they saw me put the fork on the plate. They heard it and they were like, oh, they're ready. A good servant in the kingdom of God waits. A good server in a restaurant, they hear you take that sip from your cup and they hear the little, and they're like, oh, there's a refill. They look at your body language and can tell that you're ready for the ticket. They are waiting in the background, observing and watching you so that they can be ready. A good servant in the kingdom of God waits, observing and attentively looking for any sign that the church has a need. Wait, did they say that they didn't have anybody to help? A servanthood mindset says, oh, that's an opportunity. See, a lot of people get messed up in pursuing ministry because they're ready on their schedule. And, and they're like, I want to get involved now. I want to get involved now. And, there's, and they're trying to go into an area where there's no need. 
But there's areas that have needs. And if you're attentive and you're hearing and you're watching, you'll see, oh, there's a need in that minute. Okay, that's an opportunity to serve. I'm not ready just to look at one position. I'm ready for any position that I can get involved in and help the kingdom. No one, no one may even say a word. No one may make a request. Pastor may not even call on you. But a good servant is so good at waiting that they are ready to meet needs and fill in the gaps without even being asked. That's what Jesus did. Romans 5, 6. For while we were still helpless, what does it say? At the right time. It was the perfect time that Christ died for the ungodly. And we have to wait for that perfect time. Jesus was ready, but he had to wait for the right time. The same is true for us. Look at Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Pastor preached about it. There were, there were five wise virgins who were ready. Ready is not just a sign of servanthood. Ready is a sign that you're going to heaven. Jesus is coming for a bride that is ready. The word, for this, uh, this, the word in the Greek uh, for servant is the Greek word diakonos. It's a compound word made from two words, dia and kanos. Dia means thoroughly or to, through or by, and in this case it's thorough. And konos means dust. For Greeks, diakonos was, was imagery, an expression that painted a picture. Diakonos was the picture of someone moving so quick that they were kicking up dust. This is the picture to a Gentile Christian of what it means to serve. Be so quick that you kick up dust. We should so, be so ready and apt to get involved in the kingdom that from the moment we start to the moment we finish, it's a blur because we were so ready to get involved. We must be servants that are ready, looking for needs, and quick to serve in the kingdom. The last letter is M, and that I would like to use the word meek. Colossians 3.12 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long suffering. Paul writes about the fruit of the Spirit, and he uses the word meekness or gentleness. Often meekness is associated with humility and lowliness, which is true. However, somewhere down the road, we have taken meekness to mean that we have to be stupid, unaware, and uninvolved, and just like, I don't know. This is not true. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is reservedness. Meekness is having power, skill, and ability, but not needing to showcase it to everybody. Meekness in the church is not a hope that everyone would be insignificant and without resources. The church needs people who have skills, talents, and abilities. We need people who know the word and are powerful in the spirit. But we also need people who can sit down, submit, and serve. A God-built servant doesn't, does not serve because they lack power. A God-built servant serves because they possess power. That's the true definition of meekness. Not that you lack strength. It's that you have so much strength that you're able to control your own ambition and serve. David was very skillful. He could play. He could kill. He could do it all. I, I don't know many musicians that can probably kill somebody and fight. But David was so well-rounded. You need me to keep sheep? You need me to, what do you need me to do? I can do it. But David could say, if you just need me to play, I'll play. I'm not going to try to find a way. I, I will do whatever is needed. Oh, there's a giant. I can kill it. You know, like whatever you need, I'm here. But really quickly, I want to move on and give you the risk of servanthood, and I have to hurry. Servanthood comes with the risk of not being recognized. Can we read the words of, uh, that John records concerning John the Baptist? It says, and as the disciples of John came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, Jesus, to whom you have testified, behold, he, he is baptizing in all, are going to Jesus. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. That's a principle right there. If someone gets promoted, it's from Jesus. But, but they, they don't have the character. Let Jesus deal. He is the one that lives, and he's the one. And you may not have a good perspective of that person. Your perspective of that, of that person may be warped by your own insecurities and your own failures and your own shortcomings. Let God do what he wants to do the way he wants to do it. Let, let the words of John ring in your ear. No one 
can receive anything in this kingdom unless he gives it to them. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, you remember, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom stands, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. As we all, and when we serve, we transition into the wedding party. And the church is the bride. And sometimes we, we get so invested into serving the bride of Christ that we feel like this is our bride. No. Everything we do for the bride is so that the bride can be presented to the groom. And we get excited when the groom says, okay, now let me take my, my place. And sometimes that means you have to lose your place. I heard a story of somebody, a youth pastor was telling me, he's like, man, I was working with the student. I taught them a Bible study. They were wanting to get the Holy Ghost, and it took them so long. And I taught them for like five weeks a Bible study on how to receive the Holy Ghost. And then that, the next Sunday, he got it. And then he was, we were testifying about it, and he, he went up there to testify, and he didn't even mention that I taught him the Bible study. Matter of fact, he gave credit to the person who was praying for him when he got the Holy Ghost. The youth pastor said, but I was the one <laughs> who met with you on a weekly basis and taught you. You were the, I was the one that you said, yeah, now I feel comfortable. Now I want to get it. And you didn't even recognize me. That's why John said, he must increase. I must decrease. When you are a servant, there's a risk of not being recognized. Number two, servanthood comes with the risk of serving your enemies. John 13, 1 through 5. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil, everyone say that devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things in his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. In this case, Jesus, all the disciples are there, including Judas. And Jesus gets on his knees and washes Judas' feet. The Bible says Judas already knowing, I'm about to betray him. Jesus knowing, you're about to betray me. But Jesus, the Bible says that, read what John said. He loved every one of his disciples to the end. And even knowing that Judas was going to betray him and hurt him, he got on his feet, on his knees, and began to wash the feet of his enemy. A person that didn't appreciate him, a person that ridiculed him behind his back, that sold him for a few pieces of silver. Jesus said, I know, but I'm going to wash the feet of an enemy. Even when Judas comes and kisses him, Jesus looks at him and calls him friend. Jesus teaches us that servanthood comes with the risk of sometimes serving your enemy. But if you're going to do it right way, you do it with agape. Lastly, servanthood comes with the risk of missing the big stage. And first thing was 17 through 40, then it's the Bible says, then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones. Everyone say five. five. Say it again. Five. five. He chose them from the book, brook and put them in a shepherd's back in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. We know the story. David approaches Goliath and he slays Goliath. But how many stones did it take for David to kill Goliath? And I, and I know that the stones don't have necessarily feelings. But I begin to see a picture of sometimes us. And one stone got the big stage. But what did David do with the other four stones? He didn't throw, those, he didn't throw the stones away. David knew that it was going to take one stone to take down Goliath. He, he wasn't afraid. He wasn't like, if that one misses, I'm going to get another. And if number two misses, I'm going to. No, he knew he needed one, but apparently he had some other things he needed to fight. And so he put four in his bag, four others. But there's no scripture that tells us what David did with the other four. We, we have no clue what, what happened to those other four stones. One stone got the big stage where we read about in 1 Samuel 17. It, it flew through the sky and knock Goliath out. 
We love that stone. It's the stone that gets the pulpit. It's the stone that gets the platform. But four other stones went back to the, to the valley with David. And when David saw another lion come, he says, oh, no one knows about stone number two. Stone number two may not get any recognition. He may miss the big stage, but he's needed in the kingdom. Some of us want to be stone number one that takes down the Goliath in front of everybody. But you know there's some secret behind the scenes demons that God needs to take care of, that he needs a servant to go into intercessory prayer. No one will know that you took down that giant that was coming for our pastor, but the pastor put you in his slingshot and he used you to take down something that the enemy was using to come against the church. No one may know about it, but it's still serving. Hood. You may miss the big stage, but you did not miss God's heart. Servanthood also comes with a reward, and I go quickly. Servant opens the door for the prophetic. In 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 11, Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Literally, the Bible says that he served and waited Elijah, his predecessor. Elisha had a door for oppor- and a, and a door for the prophetic open in his life simply by serving a man of God. When you serve in the kingdom, it's going to open up doors for people to prophesy over your life. I see it all the time. I've seen it in my own life. People who are giving themselves to the kingdom, God will always send a prophet to your life. He will always send someone to speak a word into your life when you are a servant in the kingdom. It's those, it's those that, you know, just want the blessing because they're there. Think about David and his brothers. All the brothers are like, eh, what about this one? No, not him. What about this one? No, not him. There's a prophet sent to a servant who is in the valley taking care of sheep. The prophet didn't even know he was there for David. But God orchestrated the pro- When you are a servant, it opens the door for the prophetic in your life. And even for you to operate in that same gifting. Servanthood opens the door for opportunity. Again, David, I, I don't have time to read it, but the Bible says that Jesse told David to take some food to his brothers. David was going to serve and prefer the needs of his brothers. He was going to meet a physical need. In the process of doing that, a door opened. An opportunity opened for him to take down a giant on a big stage. What would have happened if David said, you know what? My brothers are mean to me. They always offend me. I don't want to serve them. And he took the food from Jesse and just threw it out in the field and said, yeah, I'm good. He would have never had that opportunity to fight Goliath. Servanthood opens the door for opportunities. And lastly, servanthood opens the door of heaven. Listen, we, in, 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 um, in the world, you get promoted from servanthood. One of the lowest, the lowest keys and the lowest positions in a, in a uh, restaurant is the server. But then as you progress, you do less serving, and then you may even get to a position where you manage, and then maybe you could just own, and you just kind of can sit back and just let the business run on its own. That's how, the, that's how the world works, the kingdom of the world. You go from servanthood to less servanthood. But in the kingdom, you go from less servanthood to more servanthood. You come in the church needing, but after some time, you need to go from needing to serving. You start out being sat down at the table. You know, you come in, hey, where can we sit you at? Would you like to sit in the, would you like water at a groove? Would you like something? How can I serve you? That's how it starts. But there should come a point in your connection group where you're the one saying, hey, come on in. Can, can, where, where, where would you like to sit? You, you, don't, you shouldn't always be the one that's the coming in and everyone's serving you. There has to be a progression where you move to servanthood. And let me tell you, servanthood, in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the world, servanthood is how you start up. But in the kingdom of God, servanthood is how you end up. Read Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 through 5. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, the light, and they shall reign forever. Look at that phrase that second phrase but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him wait but they're also going to reign when we get to heaven we don't leave servanthood 
when we get to heaven, we arrive at servanthood. And we will serve the true king for eternity. If you have a problem serving down here, you're going to have a problem serving up there. Matter of fact, you won't even make it there. What is the term? Good and faithful servant. Enter in. Into your Lord's joy. You don't change. You don't, you don't move from servanthood. If you are a servant now, then you get promoted to further servanthood later. If we want to be a God-built church, and if you want to make heaven your home, it's a need for us to take on the form of servanthood. We need to be faithful. We need to be obedient. We need to be ready, and we need to be meek. We need to understand there's some risks associated with it. But the reward of servanthood is far more greater than not. Not being recognized the rewards of servanthood is so much greater than missing the big stage God wants us to be a servant even the angel when John is in the is in the uh, he has the vision the Bible says that John begins to worship the angel the angel says no stop stop don't worship me we get to serve him You are not here to serve me. He says, we together and all the servants of Christ, we are ministering to him. We are here to serve him. And John began to shift his focus from the angel and shifted it to the one, the redeemer of his soul. When you get to heaven, it's servanthood for eternity. Oh, my! I I can't wait to be a servant in heaven. It's, there's a risk to it down there, but in heaven there's no risk to servanthood. It's only reward. It's only joy. It's only peace. There's no more curse. There's no more sickness. There's no more offense. There's no tiredness. There's no weariness. You will get to serve forever, and it will be a joy. Ah, oh, I feel a Holy Ghost. Because this is what Jesus is calling us to. He's not calling us from being servants. He's calling us to being servants. Paul, who was a top echelon, he says, now I'm a bond servant to Christ. In conclusion, we understand, we need to understand that there's a gifting to servanthood. Not only has God called us to servanthood, but he has also gifted us with it. We find that there are nine main gifts in scripture that God has distributed to to all of us. And this is what I close with. There's teaching, prophecy, exhortation, giving. Helps, mercy, leadership, administration, and service. If you wonder which, which one of these giftings am I lent to, we have a form for that. Um, we, if you go to our, if you, really, really quick plug, download our church app. And if you download our church app, touch the menu and you'll see a, a, a tab that says pers- uh, um, process 1000 forms. Click that and, and it will give you a link to where you can find what we call our serviced gift inventory. It's going to ask you a few questions. And as you answer those questions, you're going to find out what your giftings are. But here's the thing. When you find out what your giftings are, you better use the giftings that God's given you. Don't, don't be that foolish servant who had a talent, who had a gift and buried it. No, say, so you know what? It may, I may just have one. So-and-so may have six, but I have one. I'm going to use my one for the kingdom. Can we stand? Amen. It's my prayer and hope that, that this lesson was both informative, practical, and applicable. I pray that through this, you found something that Maybe, maybe you are struggling with the risks. But remember, servanthood requires a re, not just a rewiring of your brain. It requires a whole new brain. A whole new brain. It requires the mind of Christ. I want you to focus and realize that there are rewards to servanthood. Remember to be faithful, obedient, ready, and meek. I want you to remember that God is calling us to be servants. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. For both the opportunity and the privilege to serve in this capacity today and minister the word on the topic of servanthood. We realize, God, that servanthood is not a least position. It's the highest position. You said yourself that if anyone wants to be the greatest in the kingdom, he has to be the least in the kingdom. I pray, God, that there would be a hunger and and a thirst for servanthood in this church. We realize that. If we want to understand the width, the breadth, the height, the length, and the depth of what you are building in our church, 
we first have to all comprehend what it means to be an agape circle.